July 2002 was a pretty exciting time. Um, the the uh, legislature had appropriated the dividends for the next year to be paid out in October, and the permanent fund was planning on transferring the money for that at the end of its fiscal year in, um, in June, and in fact did make the accounting entry to make that transfer. We like to keep the money for as long as possible to earn interest on it. And so we were going to keep the money until September 30, and the market really went bad in July and August. How bad, from the uh, fund's perspective, has the last couple of weeks been? Well, it certainly hasn't been good, Bill. Uh, we know bear markets exist, and we're going through one of the worst bear markets in the 20th century, rivaling around 1973-74. And the falling stock market uh, actually brought the permanent fund to the point where it was, uh, in, in the common term, underwater. The principal that was, the investments were worth less than the principal. And so the question was, is are you going to be able to pull out the full $900 million that you need on that date in order to meet that obligation that you set up in July? And, uh, but, but the question was, if your earnings reserve account is in fact uh, lower than the amount you have to pay out, does that mean that you're taking money out of the principal and isn't that against the Constitution? They uh, frantically uh, sought a legal opinion um, and uh, uh, got one, which uh, essentially allowed them to go ahead and make the transfer regardless and allowed them to make it immediately rather than holding on to it until the money until October. Uh, fortunately, at the end of July, the, the market uh, rose and they didn't face the, the crisis situation that they expected. Was there a moment where you actually wondered whether you'd be able to move the dividend payment over to revenue? There were a... Um, there were a number of moments when I questioned whether or not it could be done, and that's why I asked so many questions. Both counsel and uh, our outside auditors uh, were quite emphatic that it was the value of the fund at the close, when we closed the books at June 30 is what mattered. It was interesting, uh, the efforts that the uh, permanent fund folks went to, to uh, Although they answered every one of our questions uh, honestly and straightforwardly, I think they certainly didn't tell us the story. We had to tease it out ourselves. Weren't we out of money for a period of time, or wasn't the earnings reserve running a deficit account? Yes, sir. And then we had to make, the, there was decisions made by the corporation of when to take profits? No profits were taken. There were no profits to take. There was Well, in terms of cash flow yeah. availability into the earnings reserve. There were it was discussed, but nothing. Well, were, were, were then realized gains or investments sold to provide cash that sits in the earnings reserve? No. Okay, well, we'll Not anymore. It, it, it was, we held our breath, basically. And the greater question is, what is principal? Uh, and some trustees um, uh, felt uh, that, um, uh, that if the fund in the aggregate went negative below principle that you could not make the payment whether it was September 20th or July 15th, uh, which prompted, in fact, did prompt a legal opinion from the Department of Law defining what is uh, principle. And the Department of Law, the results of that legal opinion are realized income is available for appropriation. Uh, and that unrealized gains or losses float with the, the value of the fund. There was a, a legal opinion from Morrison & Forster, a, a, a prestigious uh, national law firm, uh, that held just the opposite as late as 1999. Uh, the Permanent Fund Corporation had held the opposite for, for years. Um, if somebody decided to sue on that, uh, that issue, uh, I think there'd be a good, good chance that the court would uh, would reach a different conclusion of some sort. Can you invade the principal uh, as a result of uh, of spending the earnings reserve, and uh, if the markets decline? And I think there's a, a, a long line of legal interpretations that say you can't uh, spend the principal. That just shows how important it is to change that whole system and stop thinking about the realized versus unrealized and start thinking about the fund as a big pot of money that produces value every year. A diversified fund that's got so much, you know, that's roughly uh, 50 or 60 percent in stocks and 40 percent in bonds and 10 percent in real estate is going to give you a rate of return uh, about 5 percent above inflation. 
And so you can, don't, you don't have to worry about the, the fluctuations from one year to the next. You don't have to have this portion called principle that you don't ever violate. Basically, you have to remove the word principle from the Constitution, which is how people understand what's protected now, and, and you replace that protection with a spending limit that says no more than 5%. What that allows you in bad years or down years in the short term, that there still will be a distribution each year, and that, and that in the good years will limit it, and that's how you pay back uh, if you have to draw down in the bad years. And that's what assures a payout every year, and that's how the current generation uh, would benefit better under the proposal. There was considerable debate on whether you should leave the word principle in or not. And, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the point in leaving the word principle in is simply because people have grown to expect that word there. It means something more to Alaskans than it does other people. Uh, and, uh, and so while there was a recognition uh, that you could achieve your goal in, in terms of inflation proofing and meeting your objectives without the word principle in there. It, it was hard to give it up because it's meant so much more to Alaskans and, and the permit fund. One of the fears is that as the fiscal picture of the state gets tougher and the, and the current constitutional budget reserve shrinks or runs out, there'll be pressure not to inflation proof the fund because they'll be competing uh, needs for money. And so by, by adopting POMV, we're putting inflation proofing first. What we're proposing is that you simply take the five-year average of the fund, the market value of the fund, and then we take 5% of that. And that is the limit, the maximum dollars, the 5% that can be appropriated in any given year. The POMV is not something that we uh, simply uh, created out of whole cloth. It's something that 85 percent of um, public uh, endowments, including Yale and Columbia, the Ford Foundation, and many others, use in order to find stability and um, a long-term protection for the corpus or the principle of the fund, as well as the end product of uh, income, which is going to become more and more. If you look back over the 75-year history of the, of the stock market and of the capital markets, an asset allocation similar to the permanent fund has earned over, just over 5% real rate of return. A lot of people, myself included, and, uh, and the permanent fund's own consultants suggest that the 5% may be a little optimistic, uh, that perhaps a more conservative assumption for a uh, long-run earnings uh, rate would be uh, appropriate. A lot of the politicians have been talking about taking five, but taking even more in certain years with a supermajority or other mechanisms. That's very dangerous talk. The trade-off for a POMV formulation, percent of market value, is that you have good discipline on only taking 5% in good years and bad. Because in a very bad year, a string of bad years really, you could be taking some of your principal. The percent of market value authorizes really changes the concept of principle and authorizes you to take some of the principle in bad years because you know you're going to be salting it away in good years. If you go to 1999 and you look at that, the amounts of uh, funds available in the really good years, that all could have been appropriated. T think about that right in front of the bear market and what the size of the fund would look like right now. So it's that limit on the high end is really, I believe, the most, one of the most compelling aspects of the need to change the payout methodology. Well, we changed our investment policies to get greater returns, but did not adjust the way we calculate how much of the earnings are available each year to pay the dividends. We lack a constitutionally imposed limit on how much of the earnings can be spent each year by the legislature. Under the existing formula, we've gone from $2 billion being available in, in a particular year to what we're, when we look forward a year or two where there's going to be less than a $1 billion available. A $1 billion swing is huge. It's, it's big for the, for the fiduciaries to try to plan the investments. It's hard for the legislature or the public to expect how much money can come out of the permanent fund. And so rather than having the highs that we had two or three years ago where we paid very big dividends, 
and where we're looking out a couple years and the dividend's going to drop down to about six or seven hundred dollars, the objective here is to split the difference and to stay, you know, right in the middle of that. Well, what does this mean for my dividend? Well, in one sense, it means the dividend will be safer because right now the dividend depends on the amount of income that was realized over the past five years. If you have three or four years in a row or out of the last five where you've had losses, there might not be any income. The average might be a negative number and there's no dividend. As long as there's a permanent fund under the endowment approach, there will be income available. You have to allocate a big portion of that 5% to keep the dividend held harmless. And, and I think we don't want to mince words with the public. As we now project uh, over the next 10 years, uh, the, di the dividend payout will be 25 2.6, 2.8% of the value of the fund. If you were to ask me that question just four years ago, I would have looked forward and, and, uh, and told you it probably would have been about 4%. Therein lies part of the issue when you say, what will the dividend be? Uh, what is non-predictive is what the market will do. It's meaningless because unless you come up with some fiscal plan to pay for services, you can't afford the dividend then. So you need to compare it to what you can afford, not to some hypothetical chart. I think that there will be a lot of opposition to it just because it's something that, that uh, has a permanent fund name attached to it and people will think that, that any fiddling with the permanent fund could potentially harm their dividend. It must assure that the corpus of the permanent fund, the value of the fund itself, will not decline under the application of the endowment program. Secondly, it must, in the public's mind, not adversely impact dividends. The trustee's proposal requires an amendment to the Alaska Constitution, an amendment which I fully support. This is, is consistent with my promise not to change or tamper or touch the permanent fund without a vote of the people. Therefore, I will support the legislature placing a constitutional amendment on the ballot so Alaskans can vote on it on November 2004. Well, clearly, I believe the governor had made a, a promise to the people of the state of Alaska. And frankly, that's put the legislature in somewhat of a box because it takes that option away from us. We're talking about changing the concept of principle. Um, it just seems to me to be an, an assault on every aspect of the permanent fund. It's going to be very difficult, in my opinion, to sell it to the public unless the public knows the effect that it's, uh, you know, what, what the split between government and uh, payments to the people is going to be. And uh, I doubt that there's much reason for them to vote for it if it's uh, less than 80 percent going to the public and 20 percent to government. I think maybe you could sell an 80-20 split. But most uh, politicians are now talking about 50-50 as being generous to the public. I think that's, uh, that's a non-starter. The Democrats don't want to vote for the endowment percent of market value unless the dividend's in the Constitution. The Republicans don't want the dividend in the Constitution, but they don't have enough votes to get on the ballot for the endowment without getting some Ds to go with them. It may just be a stalemate this year. I'm very skeptical now whether we can get the minority to cooperate to even put it on the ballot that uh, I may be advising uh, the folks in the legislature do even have a, a advisory vote uh, with a number of questions on it that can help clarify uh, the decisions that will have to be made. Now I'm calling for a nonpartisan conference of Alaskans to determine whether the time has come 
to use a portion of the permanent fund income to maintain essential public services. Such a proposal would be in the form of a, of a conference resolution that will be developed into a bill for submission to the legislature. The people of Alaska must agree. We must have a vote on the proposal in November. This is sort of another rant I go into with legislators. If you guys are waiting for the public to say, you know, here's my permission, you have my blessing, you can do this, it's not going to happen. They're not going to give you permission. They're not going to send you cards by the thousands saying, do this to me. This is one of those where elected officials, many of whom I like and I respect, are going to have to suck it up, do what they believe is the right thing, and if they don't get elected, well, I lost my job, we'll go, we'll go find another job together. Chance of